Okay, so we've been looking at the Belmont report and we've gotten a bit to know a bit about the scientists who were working on, um, who uh, attended Henrietta Lacks and who developed the, the HeLa cell line. And now I want to drill down more on one concept that was important in the Belmont report. And I want, I think it's going to be even more important as we go forward and we start to look at racism in medicine. And this is the concept of justice. Um, so we're in particular, you have now read an essay by Iris Marion Young, which introduces the idea of a structural injustice. And this is an injustice that is closely tied to something we're calling a social structure. So those are the two key ideas that I want to get a handle on in this video and the next one. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna have a video that introduces some of the concepts from Young, then there's an exercise, and then there's a video where that finally gets us straight to the concept of structural injustice. One way of thinking about it is to think about different aspects of Racism, but this also applies to sexism or homophobia or any time where there's hatred um, and inequality between one group and another. So when you think of racism, the most obvious thing you think of is conscious prejudice. So that person hates that person or that because of the color of their skin, because of who they are, because of where they came from. Right? And they're overt about it. Um, we're also now, I think, fairly used to the idea of thinking about implicit bias. Because this has gotten a lot of coverage. Um, and you know, a lot of people's workplaces, including mine, will have implicit bias training. And so this, this is about a different kind of prejudice. These are unconscious beliefs or attitudes about a group and that impact your behavior. So you might say, oh, I, I'm not biased against black people, but if you find yourself um, clutching your purse tighter as, as a black man walks by, you might actually be under the influence of implicit bias. The thing that I w want to get at in this section goes deeper than that. Um, and we're gonna, because we're gonna be talking about structural injustice. Here we move out of the realm of the individual and into the social. So it's no longer about your attitudes, whether they're conscious or unconscious. They are about society as a whole. So Iris Marion Young introduces this by talking about a woman named Sandy. Sandy is unemployed, a single mother of two. I'm sorry, she's employed. That's important. She has a job. She's a single mother of two. She's hardworking. She's a good parent. She plays by the rules. Her building is bought by someone who wants to convert it to condos. Housing near her job is too expensive, so she buys a car to get an affordable apartment uh, for her job. But after the down payment for her car, she can't afford to make the three months rent deposit Housing assistance has years long waiting list and so she's facing homelessness. So this is a fairly commonplace situation. Um, and it is an example uh, of injustice. And this is how um, Young articulates it. So she says, many will agree with me further that Sandy suffers an injustice in the fact that access to decent, affordable housing is so difficult for her. What are the grounds for this judgment? Her misfortune is not due to any personal or moral failing on personal or moral failing on her part. She plays by the accepted rules. So one thing to note about this passage is this middle sentence. What are the grounds for that judgment? There, um, Young is indicating that she is giving an, what we're going to be calling an argument going forward. And we're going to want to analyze almost all the concepts in this course in terms of 
argument. Um, and so you'll get details about this later. But right now, I just want to point out that some of the things that um, Young is talking about are reasons for other things. So what she says can be broken down this way. Sandy played all by all the socially acceptable rules. That's a premise. Sandy still can't find a place to live. That's another premise. Conclusion, Sandy suffers an injustice. A little bit after that, she goes on and she says, nor is Sandy's situation a matter of mere bad luck, like being struck by lightning. The major causes of Sandy's misfortune are in the normal operations of markets and institutions of planning. Again, this is another argument. What's going on with Sandy isn't mere bad luck. Why? Because it was completely predictable. It is inevitable the way our society is designed that there are going to be a certain number of cases like this. So Jung then relates this back to an, uh, some earlier philosophers. And I'm going to show some of these passages, but mostly what she's doing here is identifying what's going on here as a case of what we called previously distributive justice. And so the first thing she's going to do is identify, uh, uh, associate what she's doing with a project of another philosopher named John Rawls, who also worked on issues of distributive justice. So there's this passage from Rawls, and I'll just highlight one bit of it. For us, the primary subject of justice is the basic structure of society, or more exactly, the way in which major social institutions distribute fundamental rights and duties and determine the division of advantages from social cooperation. So this is exactly what we were talking about before we, when we were describing distributive justice. Just, any society is a cooperative effort that has certain burdens and certain benefits. How those are distributed in the ordinary operating of society is a matter for distributive justice. Rawls goes on to talk about um, the kinds of social structures that he is concerned with. He says, by major institutions, I mean the political constitution and the principal economic and social arrangements. So this is meant to cover all of society, not just um, like government or something like that. It is all of the basic arrangements of a society. Taken together as one scheme, major institutions define people's rights and duties and influence their life prospects, what they can expect to be and how well they can expect to do. So when you look at all of the social institutions as a whole, what you see is that they really just bound our lives. If you're born into a particular set of circumstances, that's going to affect everything about your life. Furthermore, these uh, effects can't be said to be something that you deserve. You haven't done anything um, because, um, to merit them because you were just born into that situation. You haven't even done anything yet. So, um, it, Walt Rawls says, it is to these inequalities, presumably inevitable in the basic structure of any society, to which principles of general social, of just social justice must in the first instance apply. We're always going to be born into a certain place and time. Um, we can't change that, but we can talk about the justice of the basic arrangements of society. So, what, would he, what do we have here? We've got uh, a discussion of a, hypothet a hypothetical situation, and we have a discussion of distributive justice, right? Um, how a society distributes the burdens and benefits of, uh, that come with the society. The next thing we need to take a look at is the idea of a social structure itself. Because what we're doing here is we're saying that social structures, not just individual actions, but social structures can be just or unjust. 
So what exactly is a social structure? Well, um, Young has a couple quotes here. Here's the quote. As I understand the concept, structure denotes a confluence of inter institutional roles and interactive routines, mobilization of resources and physical structures. And these constitute historical givens to which individuals act and which are relatively stable over time. God, that's a mouthful. Are we going to, how can we possibly under, we'll, we'll actually be able to pull this apart. But let's keep going. Let's get another thing in here. To summarize, structures refer to the relations of social positions that condition the opportunities and life prospects of persons in those positions. The position occurs because of the way th of the way that actions and interactions reinforce the rules and resources available for other actions and interactions um, involving people and structural positions. Oof. Well, that's a mouthful. But I think we can unpack it. And what I want to do is to think about a completely everyday example of a social structure. I want to think about a McDonald's restaurant. If you've got McDonald's, if you if there's a McDonald's, that McDonald's um, is actually a social structure. And that means it's going to have all of these items, institutional roles, interactive routines, a mobilization of resources and physical structures, opportunities, constraints, habits, and expectations. Let me just run through all of these, right? Institutional roles. If there's a McDonald's, there are certain roles involved with it. There's an employee, there's a customer, there's a manager, there's an owner. The customer accounts as part of the social structure. The structure wouldn't exist without customers. People in these roles engage in routines. There are just certain habits that you've got when you go to a McDonald's. People place their order. They give their money, they get their food. There are routines for opening and closing the store. There are routines for hiring and firing and playing and paying employees. There are routines for restocking needed materials, right? So a McDonald's has roles, people in roles and routines that those pe um, people are supposed to perform. The McDonald's also has um, is it also a mobilization of resources and physical structures. So if you think of McDonald's, the first thing you might think of is the physical building. That is a physical resource. Um, but there are all sorts of other physical resources involved with this. There's the food and the packaging. Um, there are less tangible things that are resources. There's the budget. There's the relationship with uh, the distribution networks, um, the relationship between the individual restaurant and the whole franchise, that sort of thing. All of these are resources and they um, are mobilized. That is, when you run a McDonald's, you've got all of these things ready to be used. So once you're in um, one of these situations, you have opportunities and constraints. As, an, as if you're in one of these roles, you have opportunities for things like employment or profit, or if you're the customer, food. Um, but you're also constrained. You're constrained by the laws of capitalism. You're constrained by the franchise contract. And uh, we all develop habits and expectations around this. People are in the habit of standing in line for food. Also, you don't try to haggle. You know that you can't bargain for a better price at McDonald's. And you've got expectations. So customers expect that service will be quick and polite. Um, employer Employees expect that customers won't make a huge scene, although that you know um, expectation is often broken. So those are all the parts of a social structure. 
and we can actually apply this to other kinds of social structures. So, um, again, roles, routines, resources, opportunities, constraints, habits, and expectations. So the next exercise actually just asks you to think about Lorain County Community College as a social structure, right? Um, you should be able to analyze what happens at Lorain County Community College the same way you analyze what happens at a McDonald's. So there are going to be institutional roles at this school the same way there are at McDonald's. There are going to be routines. There's going to be resources. All of that. So that's the next exercise you need to do.